Alright. Mic check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Duran, Max, Max Duran, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association Podcast. My name is Max Saron, and as part of our ongoing relationship with Skills Canada, we are here in Winnipeg, Manitoba at the Skills National Conference, having a fantastic time and following through with our interviews with all the NAC and the wonderful brass here at Skills Canada. In that adventure, we have here Sue Lafort, which just happened. This was not part of our plan, but this is magical interview because I didn't know you were a welder. This blew our mind. When we were reading about, you know, your profile, it came up welder. Daniela caught it right away. She's like, Sue is a welder. We have to find a way to get her on the show. So welcome, Sue Lafort, VP of Skills Canada. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Awesome, Sue. So let's, let's talk a little bit about where you are now and your role. So where do you live? What's, what's the, what's, you know, where are you based out of? So I live in beautiful Prince Edward Island. Lovely. Yeah. And are you able to work in your role as VP of Skills Canada? No problem remotely like that? Yes, it's a volunteer role and Skills Canada is a pan-Canadian organization. So there's representatives from every province and territory in Canada on the board. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, how... What is the role exactly that you have with Skills Canada? What are the roles and duties that you cover? So there, it's a pan-Canadian board of 13 members. And within that, then annually, you're voted into the executive. So there's often competition. Mm -hmm. So you have to come, you know, with your best best foot forward. Um, So in the executive role, you're having more often meetings. You're going to be often the request for uh, interviews and sometimes going on site. So in planning for this competition, last fall they have an event called National Skilled Trades and Technology Week. Mm-hmm. So I came to Winnipeg at that time and we met up. I think there was a thousand students that came to Red River College and they just did some hands-on uh, try a trade activities, some outreach, just a bit of a taste to say this is what's coming to Winnipeg. And so I would attend an, an event like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have uh, an AGM and a board meeting. And for the last three years, we've had a lot of virtual and Zoom meetings. So <laughs> we are beyond excited to be in Winnipeg and have both secondary and post-secondary competitions being held in person. You know, last year in Vancouver, you could really feel the missing piece of the secondary. Yeah, absolutely. You could really feel it. I mean, and it was wonderful coming out of COVID. Vancouver was a beautiful event. The location was fantastic. And the events, all the events ran really well. But you could feel yeah. the lack of the secondary. It's like a little piece was missing that just was off. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Because they're our future. They're the ones who are trying different trades and technologies and seeing which ones may fit. So they're in an exploration phase. And when you get to the post-secondary, that is where somebody has taken that next step and they're taking a, sometimes a pre-employment program or they're registering as an apprentice with an employer and they're on their pathway. But when you think about secondary, this is, an, I'll give an example today. I talked to somebody from Team PEI. There's 37 competitors. 13 of them had never been on an airplane. Yeah. You know, so they're traveling across the country. and All new experiences. Yeah. Never even been in a cab. So, I mean, these... These opportunities for the secondary is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even the inherent mentorship that just gets created with the secondary competitors watching the post-secondary competitors, absolutely. you know, that that's, that's their little short-term aspiration. It's not even about the mentors. They're at the top, yeah. right? It's like, wow, you know, like they're only three years older than me or, and, and look at what they can do. Look at how much harder their projects are. Look at how much different their setups are and you see them soaking all that in absolutely they can see the trajectory this is something Mm -hmm. that they like doing and they can see a path now you know it's beyond exploration and now they're starting to think about this may be a career i'd like to try and then 
right here at this event, right next to it, you have employers, you have booths of sponsors. So this is an opportunity if someone is interested and the layout that they have here is incredible that you can turn around in the carpentry area and you're very close to some of the sponsors and also some of the educators yeah. to get that next step information. I found on site. it very interesting, the layout, especially like I was up in the welding. Obviously, that's my trade. I went and did the orientation. I did my little speech with the students. And I was lucky enough to work with uh, as a mentor prior to this role. And I went to Kazan, Russia for Worlds with my with my welder. And I have that skills experience in my background, which is why I'm so passionate about the CWB working with skills because I've yeah. been both sides of the fence. And so I told them that story. Like I got to go to Kazan with a student and, and the excitement and the amazing experience. And you just see their eyes getting bigger and bigger, but you also see them getting more and more scared. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And and that's good. That's good. Cause this, like I said to them, everyone here is going to come out a winner. Like literally if you've gotten this far already in your young lives, yeah. There's nothing going to stop you in anything you're going to do, like win or lose. You know. Absolutely. And I was in Kazan also, and I, I've traveled the world. So mm -hmm. I started out in high school thinking, I don't know if I'm going to graduate. I struggled with school so much and math specifically, I, I just thought <laughs> just hated it's it. not for me. <laughs> yeah. And then it turns out I finished school and I end up register. I, I go to a, a place, this is 40 years ago. They call it manpower, where they help you I decide what yeah. you can do. And they do some aptitude tests. And mm -hmm. I scored 98 to work in the trades yeah. out of 100. And, and at the time, there was a few courses. So welding was one of the courses. Mm -hmm. And I had taken automotive in school, a bit of drafting, but never, uh, never welding. Never welding. So, you know, starting out, and I was actually the first woman welder to enter the program in Prince Edward Island. They had a full course and they did a plus one seat to allow me to go mm -hmm. in the course because they wanted non-traditional roles for females. Yeah. And Even 40 years ago. 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah. 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 So let's go back to that. That's a good time to jump into that world. You know, 40 years ago, we already know that we are short staffed. As bad as it sounds, 40 years ago, we're, we already know. I've been welding for 30 years, so I'm not too far from that. And, you know, you're a, a woman in PEI. Well, PEI is already a smaller community. You know, and the, the industry is more direct. Like, it's like this goes to that, that goes to that. There's not a lot of options. Yeah. And the colleges very much work for the local industry, they do. you know, to, to fill those voids. And they're saying, you know, we, we're going to need welders. Shipbuilding always needs welders. The maintenance the projects yeah. out there are huge. And even the infrastructure, bridges, all that stuff. There's a lot of it. And they're saying, we need a woman. We can't say no to this. Now, what was that like for you? Was it scary being the only like now you're almost like getting special treatment which puts a spotlight on you yes right and it's saying oh hey here's the new kid that we had to make space for we only had 12 booths we're gonna have to like now wire a machine to the wall and run it off the side of a table or whatever happened you know how was that for you well it's interesting because i was on probation also which and I don't want to ever see it as a negative light because it was all new and it was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I entered into the program. I was on probation six weeks to see how it would work out. And at about week five, I went to the instructor and said, you know, how am I doing? And he said, oh, my goodness. He said, I've never had welders with such high marks in their math skills or communication skills, all of it. He said, I would love to have more women. <laughs> he said, just the idea that you were trying to one up and better the next one mm -hmm. and the camaraderie. And I mean, these people, it was only a dozen of us, you know, they had my back, I had theirs. Um, and I really felt that if I learned the skills and was good at what I did on my own merit, that would be accepted. And it was, mm -hmm. it was, but I have to say when, when I graduated and we were looking for work, not a lot of shops were interested because they didn't have bathrooms and mm, you know 40 years rooms, ago I was yeah. young probably you know kind of pretty at that time <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't want disruption <laughs> but it's funny there was a couple of small shops mm -hmm. who said uh family run shops yeah, and they said in. you're topping with the class we'll like, we'll hire you right away mm -hmm. um so I did do a, a bit of work with some local shops but it's funny uh local industry just like you indicated came to the college and said we need machinists mm -hmm. and we don't even have a machinist course. How do we fast track this for industry? Mm 
And the college said, well, we have a dozen welders who just graduated, and if they're interested, we'll put on another program. And they have metallurgy, they have blueprint reading, there's so many transferable skills, and you can ticket in both, uh, you know, red yeah. seal and welding and machinist, so this is a value prop for the person. Mm -hmm. So we continued on and did machining, and that's where I had ended up working in the two Two fields, but to be fair, I was able to leverage that experience yeah. at every place that I worked because I could go into the back and I could fabricate yeah. and then I could in turn machine. So I'd be working in a tool room and then I'd be fabricating some other work. Anything breaks down. So I have to say having the two sets of skills, there's a lot of commonality and the ability to have permanent full-time work, having two areas to focus on. I've never been out of work in in my whole career. You know, I, I bring that up all the time. I'm a dual ticketed. Uh, well, I was welder than steel fab. I cut my teeth in a hydraulic machine shop, though. My first yeah. welding job was in a hydraulic machine shop, and my job was just to support the machinists. Something got a little bit too machined, I got to put it back on. You know, I, yeah. I, I got to, like, I, with the, the eyes on the lugs, I had to do all the valves on the cylinders, so that kind of stuff. And it was, you get to work with chromes and nickels yeah. and stainless and all these exotic metals because cylinders are different materials for different things. And I got to learn all the machines because the machinists were all very, very wonderful people. And they'd be like, I'd be like a little bit of downtime. Hey, go help. Well, you know, on the lathe. And they'd show me how to run the lathe, load parts. Mm -hmm. And that little bit of machine use that I got early on was so valuable for me for the rest of my life. Because then you know how to run the shear, the brake. Yeah. Once you know the symbols and the, and the buttons and you yeah. get past that fear... No machine is weird. Even if you've never seen it before in your life, you'd be like, give me half an hour. Yeah. I'll start figuring it out. When I got hired at CWB, they had this old mill in the back, and they're like, no one knows how to use that. I'm like, I'll figure it out. How hard could it be? There's only X number of, you know, there's only three axes to work with. Like, I, I can figure this out, right? And but it's funny because I did, so my welding is the same thing for me. Mm -hmm. So anytime I'm somewhere, machining is where I really focused on. And uh, CNC machining, computerized numeric control, is the areas that I really focused on, which was interesting because, again, my math issues. Yeah. So I'm working in a shop and they were working on making medical instruments. And, you know, there's heavy regulation and a mm -hmm. lot of um, a lot of quality, you know, things Control, to yeah. controls to go through. But at the same time, here I was seeing the way to progress is to program and get into the that technology side. So I ended up going back to night school for a whole year and I learned trigonometry and I was <laughs> telling them that I would take the drawings home and I would calculate out the ratios and figure out how to do it. And then when I learned trigonometry, I said, you people have no idea how difficult I made this. There's a yeah. simple formula. There's a formula for everything already. <laughs> yeah. So it's something that uh, it, it my career excelled, you know, exponentially. Yeah. Yeah. Because, Sokotoa. Yeah. <laughs> So, so at the end of the day, it's interesting how always learning and, and that skill, you know, helped me in my welding, helped me in my machining. And then I ended up ticketing as a Red Seal machinist. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part is I worked 25 years in the shop floor from shop floor up to senior management in an aerospace manufacturing company, worked on parts for the Canada arm on the space station, like just out of this world. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, when I decided that I'd go what I call the dark side of government, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, they leveraged my red seal as equivalent to a degree program. I so, had the same thing happen when I went to the college. It, so it's incredible to yeah. think somebody who may not have even graduated and couldn't see that path forward, finding the trades and the welding and the tactile experience and the ability to have something that you can see or hold at the end of the day yeah. and feel like, like I can look at that space station and see that Canada yeah. stamp and say, I made a part on that. Was that was a piece of that. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. And the trades did that for me. Well, and you know, the, the ability that you're seeing now in industry in terms of a diploma being a diploma, let's not, is it a university diploma or a trade school diploma? That was always like, well, yeah. one's above. But that's starting to go away now. When I got hired to teach at the college, you know, it's like, okay, I have two red seals. So I got hired as a diploma. You know, there's the grid, yes. right? So I got put on as a grid as having a university same level diploma. And I was like, great, that's wonderful. But then after working for a year, my boss actually came up to me and said, well, if you have two degrees, you get put at master's level. And I was like, well, I have two diplomas, two Red Seals. 
And I went and took that to HR and I fought and I won. Oh, because I mean, that is, I mean, that's well, welding and steel fab. That's seven years that's right. of training. You're telling me that that doesn't count? Yeah. You know, and, and I got it through and I was like, you know, that's, it was a huge sense of accomplishment for me, yeah. for someone who didn't have, you know, the, the, the training to do kind of anything else. I had started welding at 17. This is my life. Right. Yeah. And to be validated, like it was a validation moment. Right. Absolutely. And, and I think that's happening more and more now. Yes. And I think for the opportunity for you is to see that pathway. Mm -hmm. So while you had to fight for it and, and have that ability it's probably more mainstream now that they can see this is a great progression mm -hmm. and then parents can see this because a lot of times they're looking and understood only the pathways they may have been shown or be aware of so you know understanding the college pathway when you can do two years at a college and two years at university oftentimes people do four years university and go mm -hmm. back two years technical so four plus two instead of two plus two mm -hmm. like there's a lot that we can still learn and leverage and make it a lot easier because we don't have the people to fill the roles and we need to figure out how to how to have people trained and in a pathway that's most efficient and effective so how do we get that past the parents you know, like this, this was a battle in my own family. My mom was very disappointed that I went into the trades. My dad's a tradesperson. My mom was a tradesperson. I went into the trades and it was like, I ruined it. Like, I mean, we came to, <laughs> we came as immigrants from another country to go, go to university and become doctors and lawyers or whatever the dream was. Right. Yeah. And I ruined it by becoming a tradesperson. And it wasn't until I got a job teaching at the college. And this is 25, 26 years later. When I got that job teaching my college, my mom was like, wow, now I'm proud of you. It's like, really? <laughs> All this other stuff, raising my kids, having like my perfect, welding treated us just fine. Yeah. But it wasn't until I got like this status that it was okay with my own mom. And if the, I had that kind of problem with my parents, how do I convince other people's parents that this is a viable thing and not like viable, like, oh, I guess it's an option, but like first option, like yeah. top of the list. And that's a, an amazing question because I don't know if we figured it out. I think the first step would be having parents come by and see events like to this. this yeah. And you know what? Our alumni, when I hear them talk, it sends shivers down my spines because they've lived it. They've gone through it. And, and the biggest part is if they feel that this is a pathway for them. And, and I think about, you know, the trajectory. You can go from high school into trade school and then leverage that in private industry and earn a decent living. If a parent can understand the stigma of trades is not considered a second choice, mm -hmm. it's a first choice. And, you know, the last job I had is director of apprenticeship for Prince Edward Island. So you can imagine I'm in, I'm, I'm in a significant role that can support all kinds of youth and people in trades and technologies to further their education and careers. So I was signing red seal certificates. Mm -hmm. So you think about that from barely finishing high school <laughs> and taking night school and work in shift, work and shop mm -hmm. for 25 years and keep progressing. And then now have a government job and a director role. Yeah. It's just incredible to think that that's a pathway that can be available for anybody, anybody, anybody. Yeah. yeah. And I, I retired. Yeah. So I've just retired this year. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. How's that going? I love it. But it's funny. Everybody <laughs> wants you to work then. <laughs> so it's interesting that you, you do your pathway. So I was afforded the ability to retire. It allows me time to continue. So now I'm vice president of this board. Mm -hmm. I have the time to allocate to that. So I volunteer provincially as a chair of the provincial board and manage that competition um, and staff. And then nationally, I'm the vice president of the board and, and everything that ties to that. And internationally, I've been volunteering since 2007 with World Skills. Mm -hmm. So I was an observer in Japan. And then in Canada, we hosted in 2009, the international competition. And I was called a workshop manager. So setting up for an entire month, a full competition site for the world to come and challenge their skills. And then 2009, 11, 13, 15, I was the expert for Canada helping train the CNC competitor. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was voted by my peers to be their chief expert. So you can imagine 34 countries, many wouldn't see women in leadership role. Yeah. And there's very few at the international level. In the last few years, they're increasing in that number. And, um, you know, so to be able to volunteer and put that time. So I recently 
um, stepped down as chief expert and world skills uh, appointed me as a skill advisor to help audit the quality and assessment of their competitions or test projects mm -hmm. and their marketing schemes. So, so basically, they're not letting you get away. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite volunteer group I've ever worked with in all the trades and technologies yeah. and oversight in that. So. Now, in the terms of what you see with Worlds, because Worlds is a whole nother game, right? Yes. How do you see Canada's growth as a competitor on the world scene? You know, I've only been to one now, and I hope to be at all of them going forward, right? How do how do we go? I know my experience, but it was one. You have yeah. over over 10, you know? Yeah. It's interesting because when you think about what our intention with Skills Canada is, it's exploration, it's awareness, that youth engagement. And then when you shift to being very focused on Canada on the world stage, that's another intention. And I think what I see from um, a representative of Canada as an expert and training competitor is understanding what other countries do. How do they excel? And how, how do certain countries always stay in the top? Mm -hmm. So it's that, that volunteer group going in, understanding and networking and being, bringing back best practice. So when I was there, I saw tools that I had not been exposed to, came back, met with our sponsors and suppliers here and said, this took five minutes off how a competitor could, could compete effectively. Mm -hmm. And five minutes can be the difference between a silver and a bronze medal. 100%. And it even could be how you, um, how you assess your workstation setup and things like that. The Prep, very, everything. Everything. Yeah, yeah. And then back to what type of equipment you're working on. So all of that means that Canada is sharing. So we're sharing what we do well in our vocational systems. And then in turn, those experts are, are being around 20 and 35 other experts around the world and they have ideas and they share and you can come back and apply that into our system and we have a red seal certification system that is incredible and allows a person to have the pride of meeting a certification standard but at the same time this is an opportunity for us to understand what other countries are doing and to learn and integrate yep. it and world skills has a standard that they've mm. set and they're trying to make sure that it's the best of every country's standards and certification. They're leveraging to that level to say this is a, an international standard that yeah. we are using for competitions. Well, I know that when I was in, in Kazan watching these companies come in, I learned from both ends of the spectrum. You know, you have the Chinas and the Japans that are like, they run the board, right? They are so on the ball for how they do stuff. The way they fund and sponsor their competitors is the, uh, there's a word in Spanish, orgullo. It's like the, 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 what you would want to be everywhere, you know? Yeah. And then, so I learning from them, they got great tips and tricks, just watching them, watching how they interact with the mentors. Like, okay, they got this. And then I seen like Ghana or Somalia roll yes. in with one competitor and they've trained for three months. They barely had access to a welding machine, but they were able to put a team together and get someone in. And, you know, this kid, he doesn't even think that he's going to be anywhere near a podium, but he is having the most amazing experience that will shape not only him, his family, his community Absolutely. forever. And I'm watching this kid weld and he's amazing. Yeah. He's amazing. And I was like, he had some stuff figured out because he didn't have the tools. He didn't have the machine. He didn't have access to a mentor. So he figured some stuff out just on his own. And some of that stuff was pretty genius. You know, and I remember like pulling my guy in and saying like, look at these people. Everyone here has got something to offer. Yeah. Everyone here has got something to offer. You also have something. They're watching you too. They are. You know, so take it in and give it out. Be part of the community. This is the thing, you know. Absolutely. And, and I've seen people come with, eight foot toolboxes and a Ziploc <laughs> baggie. And I got to say that we, in that community, in that event, they wrap their arms around every competitor because they're all tradespeople mm -hmm. there. We don't want anyone left behind. And it is a competition. It is a medal. That's what you're going for. But at the same time, that competitor who comes in with that baggie, he has skills. Mm -hmm. He's earned his spot there and he's equal to them all. One of the observations I've made over the years is, is, 
you can have a, a country put a lot of money behind all of the training, have engineers and, and do two and three years. But if you step one step off of the norm of the competition, that's when other countries, and that's where you get somebody who is able to adapt because they know the scope of their trade. Yeah. And that's where I saw the, the people excel yeah. is when it was the unknowns and the uncertainties. They could evolve on the spot. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I find Canada is very strong like that. If you had, if you had to say, let's step outside of this and we're going to give you a different material and a different welding rod. And here's a machine no one's touched. I know Canada. And I know the competitors, they would be prepared to hold their own and rise above because they are trained for their workforce and they're applying that workforce skills and their vocational training at that competition. So whether we get two medals, seven medals or medallions of excellence, you know that their skills are comparable. Mm -hmm. And if you as a lay person looked at their projects, you'd probably be amazed like it's works of art that that some of them are doing now. Yeah, well, by yeah. by today, I'm going to be out there at the end of the day taking pictures because things will be out on the tables for the welders. Yes. And I'll be able to take the pictures and show on, on the Absolutely. social media. And uh, and it's already, like, at the local level, there's always a little, like, oh, this one's not so bad, this one's not so good. But by the time you get to this level, yep. they're all good. They're all good. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets real tight, right? Yeah. So yeah. Now, in terms of what you know skills is doing to support you know the trades we have these conferences but then there's also like the nacs the advisory committees you have the kids that are you know there's they're still in their 20s and they're already in this mode of volunteerism and of giving back and and of really understanding the effort that the community put into them succeeding and them giving back you know how do you feel about that and the success with those groups that is absolutely what what drives all of us to continue to show up is the life-changing stories we hear from alumni. Mm -hmm. So I'll give an example today. I was at uh, the symposium and they, they had a, a young man get up and speak. And it turned out, he said, oh, I started in high school and then I went to this next one. And he said, and then I went to Sao Paulo. I went to the America's competition and I was looking at it. I thought, I was in Sao Paulo. And then I looked again <laughs> and thought, oh my goodness. 10 years ago, he was a high school student who was competing, and I couldn't believe that he went through that competition. It changed his life. He ended up, now he's the executive director for Saskatchewan. He came full circle. He said, I appreciated every part of that journey, and it resonated so much that now he is working within that. Mm -hmm. And I can't even imagine how he would speak to youth and say, this is, this is my story. Yeah. And the alumni, when I hear their stories, and some of them, they're, they had no hope. Some, I, I was absolutely last gutted. Last straw, last yeah, straw. And, yeah, and it was like, I didn't feel valued, I didn't feel this. And then I found, and then whether it was welding or machining or cooking or hairstyling, they found something that they felt that they could contribute. Mm. And then when they get to a level like this, they're built up. Yeah. And then when they tell their stories, and the public speaking, I'm... I'm absolutely amazed. Why are they all the so youth. good at it? They're so good. <laughs> I had to practice for so long and all these kids we've been interviewing, they're all just so good at it. It's like, they, are. <laughs> they are. And you know what? It's truth. Like mm -hmm. they just speak from, you know, from a, their heart. A place of, of purity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I could, I could listen to them all day long. Now in your career over, you know, the 25, 26 years on the shop floor, you know, what were some of the obstacles you had that you perhaps can still see today or perhaps maybe gone? Some of the challenges are um, really making sure that you have the skills to keep succeeding. Mm -hmm. So as the technology changes, employers now, they, they may put things in front of you, but if they don't, um, I had to go outside of it to see. So I mm -hmm. think now because the industry itself needs help to help build. So when they, they're looking at um, retraining and, and upskilling up yeah. and all these new words, that, but the government is getting behind those activities. I think that's really important. I think that you can take people who are loyal within your organization and build their, if they have interest, mm -hmm. build that skill set within so that you're not trying to always bring other people in. It's taking that internal loyal person and helping them to get to that next step. Um, 
You want to foster them, right? Yes. Yeah. And if they're already an integral part of your organization, um, I saw something, I was in Cleveland doing the welding competition. I was oversight of that. And it was interesting. They had a whole training program there. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful Lincoln. school. And, and, beautiful. And, and they yeah. take people and say, your first year you can do a generalist position. And then after that, if you're interested in working in our shop, building these machines, here's your way, here's your path forward. Mm -hmm. And it can also remove that cost barrier or yeah. other barriers. So I was really excited that I was talking to a security guard who said, I have two brothers who are now working in the plant and they have permanent full-time work and they have all kinds of concessions around what's important to those people in mm -hmm. their community. And they're worried about is being laid off. So they have a certain rule that says, we won't lay you off. If we ever have a slowdown, you may do other work. So mm -hmm. it, it really spoke to what kept that base group happy with what they were doing and how they could keep them engaged and not have when maybe industry goes slower or quieter that you're keeping that connectivity. Yeah, you're not just out on your butt. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. what about barriers that the youth might face now? You know, 2023... They're coming through college or, or a pro trades program, let's say, and they're a year or two out of graduating. You know, what are some of the barriers you're going to see? Like the work is out there. That's the part yes. we, all, we all agree on. Yeah. We all agree that the work's out there, but there's always some barriers that are inherent in every generation. And I think right now I've never seen so much support by governments behind you. So I would really indicate if, if a barrier is cost, find where you live, talk to the people in that area because there's a lot of sponsorship mm -hmm. and there's a lot for under underrepresented. And um, so the first thing around costs would be make sure that that's not the reason because there's there's probably ways locally that can Absolutely. be helped. And if you're visiting your, your uh, local HR area or their colleges, they'll be able to help you with that. Uh, another thing is, is, you know, it's hard work. So welding was hard work. Standing on cement floors was hard work. Mm -hmm. um, making sure now they have PPE and all other equipment so your health is not put at risk where it might have been many, many years ago. So you can be looking at this as a, a, a safer choice that you can work in an industry that you can live long and work at it. But it is hard work and oftentimes it's shift work. Mm -hmm. And I did... 15 years of shift work. Yep. And I think, you know, my husband was a nurse and we had no family. So thinking about the barriers would be to childcare and to be able to, you know, access some of those things. So I think childcare has become uh, mm -hmm. a more common issue because we were trying to, to have uh, all people, men and women. Yep. And we know that oftentimes childcare is a big component of that. Yep. So figuring that barrier out. Um, and then the other thing is if you enjoy doing it. So <laughs> oftentimes, um, you know, it has to be something that is for you. And if it's not, there's all kinds of try careers out yeah. there. Yeah, try something else. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely loved it. And if I could go out today, I was doing an interview and they had simulation of welding. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting. I, I've never used simulators. I've only welded. How'd you do? I did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I think the guy on CTV may have done a little worse than me. But we did have a female apprentice steam fitter, pipe fitter. And she mm -hmm. said, I do a little welding. She was excellent. Yeah. She she beat us out completely. Uh, when they're young, they're so steady yeah. still. <laughs> <laughs> Give me five more minutes. I'm yeah, pretty competitive. I was going to practice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you brought up childcare and barriers. I love that conversation. I feel like that's something that, uh, I, and this is worldwide, we've done a great job of opening women's eyes to the trades, especially like I'm speaking mainly from welding, but it, the, the attrition rates are terrible. Lots will come in. The top of the funnel is good. That's what we talk about. the top. And we've invested lots into the top of the funnel to make yeah. sure. And I see classes across Canada. I travel across Canada, college to college, checking them out. And I see classes that sometimes are majority women, which is wonderful. But when I see the statistics four years out, very few have stuck it out yeah. to journey person. Yeah. yeah. Or even less have not gotten to the supervisor, foreman, owner. Because that's really where the change starts to happen. Yes. When you start getting the women to be in power positions and role CEOs of companies, you know, main VP. Yes. That's when it starts to happen. 
And childcare is something that comes up often in that conversation because, you know, it's like, oh, I'm being successful. I, you know, things are going well. I finish school. I get married or whatever it is, married or not. I'm have, and then I have children. And then I'm pulled out of the workforce for X amount of time. And that creates an uncertain period, right? Yeah. When I was working in Africa, the mines actually, so like the mine owns a town. It's kind yes. of a weird setup. But the mine gets put in the ground and then a town pops up around it, right? <laughs> and the, the mine owns the hospital, the mine owns the school, the mine, and everyone that works at the mine basically is taught and raised and fed by the mine, which obviously there's some cons to this. Yes. But one of the things that I thought was very interesting is that the mines all offered childcare. Yeah. It was just like part of the job. And I came back to Canada being like, why can't we do something like that? When you work for a company and you're a female and you have kids, that's not a, oh, we'll have to figure something out. The plan is there already. Oh, you have two children? Okay, they're going to go to this daycare. It's covered by our company. Yeah. Done. That's zero barrier. It's not even a question. It's not something you have to think about or negotiate. Like, why are things like that not happening? Do you see this in our future someday, some type of format? I think it'll have to be if you want to retain them. So mm -hmm. like you say, you can get people interested. And a lot of women are excellent welders. I know that Fantastic. I do take in yep. the, 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 right, the two hands and manual dexterity and all of that. So I think uh, an understanding of that needs to be developed more. and needs to be that it's not the onus on the person, mm -hmm. that this is something that's been figured out. Yeah. And we ended up managing and finding childcare and all the rest because we were both shift work. So yep. it was very, and I had a babysitter and a backup babysitter and things mm -hmm. like that. The, the other thing around barriers, and this is, I haven't personally had it and I've struggled with it, is the way women may be treated on job sites and yes. may be treated within shops. And I talk about when I first graduated that, uh, the, you know, the, the highest employer that I had chosen, I might, I would want to go to, they said, we, we will take you, but you're going to be the first woman on the floor and it's going to be probably pretty challenging. So when other shops wanted me, I went to the other shops that were open arms and years later I was approached by that large company mm -hmm. and I said, you know what? Thanks. I'm happy where I'm at. Yeah. But at the same time, like, so there why is, why did that have to yeah, happen? Why did it have to happen? Yeah. And I'm saddened that it still happens. Mm -hmm. So I meet and, and work with, some women's groups and, and other groups and mentorship of young women. And I'm, I'm really, I didn't have that experience. I had a shop that supported me. Um, I excelled. I probably made more than the men by mm -hmm. times. It wasn't any of their business and mine wasn't theirs. I was good at what I do and I really wanted to increase. So going from shop foreman or lead hand to shop foreman and learning every aspect of the shop and becoming a QA and quality, like mm -hmm. I kept building my skills so that they could pay me more money and mm -hmm. I would learn new things. But at the same time, when I got up further into the company, I could help support management and saying, we want 30% women. Yeah. We want to have a ratio here that complements because it works better when we have all different types of um, right. abilities and people. So, but I've also heard that the environment is still challenging. We're at 4% welders in Canada right yeah. now. Like, I mean, that's abysmal. It is. And, and I, I can't, like I had a great experience and I met with some women and they said, yeah, but you're very forceful. You're very outspoken and you, you probably wouldn't tolerate it. I said, but when I was 19, Mm -hmm. And I was there. I, I that probably if that was it was a, different a person, it yeah. was a negative situation. So I think building up an opportunity for somebody to have a mentor to be able to help them through those challenges, so that they can find a place that doesn't allow someone else to stop their journey. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I'm struggling with some of the answers. Yeah, on, I struggle with it too. Yeah. Uh, I actually look at the LGBTQ movements and the trans mm -hmm. movements as learning lessons even for gender equality with women in the That's workplace right. in terms of the allyship the concept yeah. of allyship i love the concept of allyship which means that i will not idly stand by and watch someone right. do something yeah. so if i'm in the workplace as a male i'm a privileged male able-bodied had my privileges and i see another male treat a female poorly i will not just laugh along mm -hmm. i will step in and say no this is not okay 
And that I think is going to be maybe just first step yes. to just breaking the whole dang thing. Because the patriarchy needs to be broken, right? Like it just yeah. needs to break. And things don't like walls don't come down without hammers. Like I mean, we're tradespeople. This is a, they don't go down with whispers and feathers. No. You know, it takes hammers and and, and <laughs> it's true. It's true, right? So this is it, it will be a, maybe a little bit of ugly back and forth, but it needs to happen. And I think it is. And I yeah. I see. Yeah. When we're out there today at the competition site and we're seeing more women mm -hmm. and I, my heart's just swelling seeing yeah. that and then seeing all of the people working around that woman, like it doesn't feel like it's anything it's unusual. Out of place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I always felt like I didn't want a spotlight. I just liked working in the trades mm -hmm. and that was it. I didn't want to be because you're a woman, because you're this, because you're that. I'm really good at it and I enjoy it and I love the people I worked with. Yeah. Yeah. So when I talk or when we all talk about the skills gap that's impending happening <laughs> right now, I get a little scared, to be honest. I mean, I've been around the, the block a few times now and I've seen some shortages. I've been a part now in my career of a few busts and booms, like the ups and downs. But I don't know if I've ever seen anything like this skills gap that's coming up. And I, you know, I'm sure as you do, I get this, the reports and the statistics come across my desk almost weekly. Right. And I'm looking at these numbers and I look at the colleges across Canada and the number of students or even we have access to. And I think, I don't, I don't know how we get out of this or how we fix this. Obviously this is a part of it, Yes. but we need more. Yeah, we do. Right. So how do we, you know, what's your opinion on that? What do we do <laughs> to bump those numbers? Like immigration people telling people to have more babies baby credits i don't know like <laughs> what is it that we need well and i think it really the awareness that we have so 13,000 people in manitoba are getting exposed over these couple of days mm -hmm. and i think opportunities i heard in ontario is almost 30,000 mm -hmm. and alberta was another 10 or 15,000 so i think that these happening across this entire country culminating in this event here is one piece of it but it's making sure that the barriers can be removed so we can access more people mm -hmm. so four percent women welders is not reflective of what really could be in this industry mm -hmm. so i think maybe beyond just immigration is recognizing how to just influence and that includes parents and awareness mm -hmm. and exposure of students um it's it's challenging i think job transitioning is going to be big yeah. i think you know like uh when people are down and out it's like oh you're gonna go work at in service or in this or that. And it's like, no, you know, you can become a welder at 40. You can. My mom went back to university at 40 and rechanged her whole life. There's no age limit, no. you know, and especially with technology, people are like, well, I'm too weak or old or I'm not strong enough to get into the trades. That's not really a thing anymore. No, it's, it's not, not really, filthy and it's no. not heavy labor. Those are two misconceptions. Yeah, yeah. A lot of shops are very clean and mm -hmm. the processes themselves are not onerous. They're very... Um, you got jib cranes, you got yeah. magnets, you got everything. That's like, right. Yeah. So your hand skills, absolutely required, mm -hmm. but your strength and your back and whatnot... I think, uh, yeah, I'm working, uh, I'm trying to get on a project at Conestoga college right now for exoskeleton support. Yeah. Have you seen those? So even if you are unable bodied or you have a weakness or you have a bad arm, you can put on a suit that will make up for it. Yeah. So like even these barriers are coming away, you know, we're looking at trying to figure out programs with the incarceration systems, penitentiary Absolutely. systems. We have people that are coming out of jails that we, we need them to work. We need yeah. everyone. We need everyone. That's <laughs> yeah. a great statement. And I think getting into those pockets mm -hmm. and one step at a time yeah. and, you know, people need to have something to do when they return back to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a regular life and having something that is a skill that's tactile. With that's good money. Good money yeah, in yeah. it. Yeah. And I think the money is going to keep increasing also um, <laughs> as needed. And it will it will also drive parents to say, this is a career. I noticed one of the IT skills posted the jobs that they are paying in this region <laughs> right now for the open positions right now. So somebody can walk by and actually take a glance wow. at and look at. This is the salaries for the 17 positions mm -hmm. in Winnipeg right now for this career choice. Awesome. Well, we've probably already gone long here. I don't know. <laughs> so like, this has been a fantastic conversation. I could talk to you all night. This is fantastic. We're going to have to have beers later. This we is, will. <laughs> that is fantastic. But, you know, to wrap up the last couple of questions, you know, and this is kind of part of the skills series that we're doing. 
is in terms of your own skill development. So if we went back to you being a young woman and you're just getting into coming out of high school, figuring it out, take a welding program to now, you know, what were like, say the one or two main skills, you know, which you can be specific if you want to get into essential skills, but you know, just skills in your life that you feel you really had to hone, maintain, nurture to be successful. I think the biggest thing would be continuous learning. Yeah. So, you know, starting out in one career area and then having exposure and opportunity to pivot a bit and do another transferable skill set. And they aligned and said, you have metallurgy, you have math, you have communications, you have blueprint reading. So understanding that where you start isn't where you're going to end. Mm -hmm. And continuous learning is something that, you know, when I ended up going to that government job, I ended up going to university and taking university level courses that I may have missed out on. And it's funny because all the stuff they were teaching, they ended up being life skills I would have learned on the job. Yeah, you already knew mentoring. it. Mentoring, yes. But now they got I'd, names. They got names and you can <laughs> apply it. And so I would say the biggest thing would be understanding that trajectory of your career is not where you're starting, isn't where you're ending. It's limitless. And having opportunities either present themselves or you go looking for them. And in my, my case, I look ahead a year or two and decide where is it that I would like to go and what would I like to do? And mm. then make that happen by finding what do I need to do? Yeah, what are the steps? What are the steps? How yeah. do I get there? Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. It's great All right. fun. Last question. If you can go in a time machine, okay, if you can go in a time machine and back to you know, you're right in front of yourself right before that first day of welding class. You don't really know. You kind of hated school, yeah. you know, trying to figure this out. But now you know everything that you know today. Yeah. What piece of advice would you give yourself if you could just pop up in front of yourself back then? Just be confident and be a sponge. Learn everything that people are offering to help support you. Lean on those resources. And uh, yeah, the opportunities of that community around you. Mm -hmm. lean into them more because thinking that you're not deserving of it. Uh, it's not true. It's not true. No. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, it's been a fantastic <laughs> interview. It's been so much fun. So thank you very much Thanks, for man. coming on the show. It was awesome. I, yeah. And for all, you know, do you want any shout outs, any hellos or, or anything to anybody? Oh, I'm absolutely amazed by how well this event face to face with secondary, post-secondary skills, competence, Canada and Winnipeg and Winnipeg's uh, skills organization and apprenticeship Manitoba uh, mm. just amazing. out of the park amazing yeah. thank awesome. you well thanks to everyone who's been following along thank you Sue for being on the show everything's been going great with this is a part of our skill series they'll be released in June in a number so if you come across this uh, episode make sure you to check out all the other ones and you know make sure you check out the skills website and what's going on there and also of course the cwb association make sure you're a member and a part of it keep downloading sharing and clicking on our links and please comment on the podcasts so that we know what you'd like and what you don't like be free to give us suggestions anytime thank you very much and stay tuned for the next episode we hope you enjoy the show 